Whimsical World presents Bedtime Stories. Hey there, it's me, Derek Taylor Kent, author of Simon and the Solar System. Have you ever dreamed of visiting the stars? Have you ever wondered what aliens are like? Me too! I really wanted to be an astronomer when I grew up, but I became a writer instead. That doesn't mean I still didn't want to learn everything I could about the planets and stars, though. I loved it so much, I wrote this book about it. And of course, I had to have an alien in it, too. Get ready, young astronauts. It's time for... Simon and the Solar System Written and narrated for you by the author, Derek Taylor Kent. Young Simon Beck lay awake in his bed, with visions of planets at play in his head. But Simon was scared. He had no time to rest, for tomorrow was Simon's astronomy test. He'd studied all night, but the facts had not stuck. Was the sun very small or as big as a truck? Yes, passing this test would require some luck. The stars were his passion, but names weren't enough. The science behind them, now that part was tough. He read in his bed, but he soon fell asleep when something awoke him that made his heart leap. A beam from a starlight streamed into his room. And something was riding it, just like a flume. The windows burst open, and then with a flash, a spaceship zoomed in, with no clamor or crash. It hovered and covered, but most of the floor. It looked like a speedboat that traveled on shore. A hatch opened up, and a creature appeared. It wore an orange spacesuit, green skin, and a beard. My name is Neil Newton, the creature remarked. I hope you don't mind where my spaceship is parked. No, said young Simon, I certainly don't. But that doesn't mean that my parents still won't. Don't worry, said Neil. With my time warp device, time has now stopped just for us. Ain't that nice? I'm here on a mission to give you a tour, to show you the wonders of space's grandeur. In that little spacecraft, said Simon so keen, what could I see that I have not yet seen? A lot, said Neil Newton. This ship is a zoozer. It's quite a bit better than everyday cruisers. We'll zoom in our zoozer right through Saturn's rings, for the zoozer's a spacecraft that's built for such things. The cosmos invites you tonight as its guest to see why astronomers' lives are the best. From planet to planet we'll wander with zest, and tomorrow I think you will ace that old test. Though normally Simon would not ride with strangers, something inside him dismissed all the dangers. They jumped in the zoozer and buckled their belts and zoomed into space, where discoveries dwelt. They soared up to space like a sky-cutting blade, their velocity smashing the speed barricade. Simon gazed upon Earth like a heavenly bird. The vision he saw is not worthy of words. Detached from this object, this mystical orb, this holder of life with unlimited cords, he realized that living is life's own reward. Dazzling, said Newton. It's like Mona Lisa. 
Your planet leans back like the Tower of Pisa. The tilt of the Earth at its certain degrees causes Sydney to burn while in London they freeze. The North and South Hemisphere alter in season. The angle of sunlight, I hear, is the reason. And look at the planets and all of the stars. There's Saturn and Neptune and Venus and Mars. The rest of the stars are a distance so vast, their light may take eons to reach us at last. When you look at a star, you are viewing the past. To start off the tour, you just think of a spot. And the zoozer will trot to the spot you have thought. But stay in this system. That is the one rule. If you go any further, we'll run out of fuel. So Simon thought hard of a good place to spring, then found himself flying right through Saturn's rings. <gasps> Oops, said Neil Newton. What bad navigation! The ship has been set onto teleportation. These rings are composed of immense blocks of ice. If we were to hit one, it would not be nice. Their minds were so muddled a thought could not form. The ice rocks were rushing like bees in a swarm. Neil took the controls. He abandoned his fear. He zipped and he swerved around each that came near. He dove below this one. He zoomed above that one. He dodged every ice rock with reckless abandon. With one mighty tug, he flew up with a zing. Safely escaping those hazardous rings. You see, said Neil Newton, it's built for such things. <laughs> Although this new order is not as I've planned it, let's go on a tour of the gaseous planets. The gaseous planets are made of thick air, an ocean of gases that swirl everywhere. First we see Jupiter, red as an apple, where poisonous liquids and gases wage battle. Enormous in size, it obscures little Earth more than 300 times in celestial girth. And there at the heart is the giant red spot. A storm that has lasted for eons, a lot. You once were too far, but now look where you are, observing a mass that was almost a star. The sight of these planets made young Simon swoon. Saturn, Uranus, and even Neptune. They toured every planet as Neil Newton lectured on temperature, gravity, distance, and textures. At the end is poor Pluto, once called a small planet, but scientists say it's too small, so they canned it. Now called a dwarf planet, this small icy rock and its satellite Charon got kicked off the block. So, said Neil Newton, where next shall we go? You tell me, young Simon, I'm longing to know. So Simon thought hard, and he said with a pause, Could we possibly walk on the surface of Mars? I thought you might ask that, said Newton with spunk. So I packed us two Mars walking suits in the trunk. The engine was blasting. They sped like a spout. They put on their spacesuits while floating about. They came to the planet. Neil read from a book. There aren't any Martians, so please do not look. The surface of Mars appears red and all dried, cause its soil is made out of iron oxide. It once had an atmosphere much like the Earth with water and air that gave life chance for birth. But being so far from the sun wasn't good. The air leaked away and all life was kaput. Although there's no Martians, there's still chance for danger. Well, said young Simon, to that we're no stranger. 
They flew down to Mars and Neil landed the craft. The land was so strange, Simon just about laughed. They stepped off the zoozer and took in the sight. Wow, said young Simon, I feel half as light. That is because Mars's mass is less loaded. It's half that of Earth, so you feel half as bloated. It's the best working diet that science has noted. But this place is nothing, a mere introduction. Let's cruise in the zoozer and I'll show you something. They sped in the zoozer across the terrain. A land so bizarre it made Pluto seem plain. As Newton zoomed forth like a racer at rally, he stopped at a place called the Marina Valley. Neil Newton explained as he felt a small gust, the Marina Valley's a crack in the crust. It's so long and deep, it's a sightseeing must. It makes the Grand Canyon look smaller than dust. But then something happened. The gust became stronger. Neil Newton and Simon were cheerful no longer. I thought this might happen, said Newton forlorn. We soon shall be caught in a giant dust storm. These winds are so strong, the whole land might be torn. Why, thought young Simon, was I ever born? Quickly, yelled Newton, jump into the zoozer. In there we'll be safe from this dusty diffuser. The storm was upon them. Young Simon was shaking. The storm began roaring and howling, breathtaking. Neil Newton declared as he pulled on a lever, this storm riding mode is quite helpful and clever. Propellers popped out from the top of the craft and fast bottom fans made an air riding raft. Suddenly, a gust of dust hit them. They shot like an arrow. The storm took control with the might of a pharaoh. The ocean of storm dust was worse than they feared. The ship rose up with it but could not be steered. Blinded by redness, they flipped here and there, upwards and downwards, about everywhere. Surviving this circumstance would not be easy. Already our heroes were far beyond queasy. The winds began slowing. The dust started clearing. They started to fall and the ground started nearing. They'd risen so high they would fatally fall. But then they hit something. Not falling at all. Phew, said Neil Newton. How lucky for us. The storm let us down upon Mons Olympus. An ancient volcano that now is extinct. It's by far the top peak in the system, we think. We're 20 kilometers high on this terrace. That's four times as high as that tiny Mount Everest. On top of the mountain, they gazed across Mars. The gleaming pink sky like a blanket of stars. An endless horizon through deserts of red. The danger was worth it, young Simon Beck said. Where next should we go? Simon heartily asked. I want every secret still hidden unmasked. It's time to go home, Newton sadly replied. But luckily Earth's on the sun's other side. We'll venture to Venus and Mercury too. Why even the sun is a sight we can do. They bolted to Venus, its surface and shrouds, an oven of acid and sulfuric clouds. And Mercury's worse, it's as small as the moon, a wasteland of craters and cooking sand dunes. Racing through space couldn't be much more fun, until at the end... They encountered the sun. They put on their sunblock and super sunglasses 
and learned with a glimpse a whole year's worth of classes. Just look, said Neil Newton. Take notes for your quiz. It's a million times bigger than Earth. Yes, it is. How hot is the sun? Could it cook frozen peas? At the center, it's 25 million degrees. A process called fusion takes place in its core as hydrogen atoms collide in a war. This chemical crashing induces a bond. New helium's made and the hydrogen's gone. By use of this method, it generates heat, which maintains life on Earth and grows food that we eat. Wow, said young Simon, our sun is so neat. Now buckle your belts and grab hold of your hair. My sensors are sensing a great solar flare. The magnetic energy stored in the sun will break free from its reins and burst forth like a gun. Then, just like Neil said, the hot plasma, once pinned, erupted. Creating a great solar wind. Like riding a wave to a far distant shore, they rode the flare home to the small window door. All right, said Neil Newton, the cure is complete, and we barely survived by the skin of our feet. We had a good time, but it is time that we parted. And speaking of time, it is time that time started. Neil repushed the very first button he pressed, and time resumed back from the moment they left. Neil jumped in the zoozer and cried out with zest, Goodbye, Simon Beck, and good luck on your test! As Simon waved by, his young eyes nearly wept. But Simon was tired, and so Simon slept. The next day at school, Simon hardly could wait. He wanted that test because he knew he'd do great. But then Mrs. Fiddlebone mentioned with sorrow, I've chosen to postpone the test till tomorrow. <coughs> yes, Simon was mad as he walked out the door. But then he thought, Wait. I could learn even more. Wow, I wonder where Simon and Neil are off to next. Do you think aliens exist? What do you think they might be like? Do you think there are other planets like Earth out there? If you want to be the first to discover them... Maybe you could be an astronomer when you grow up. You could get to look through the world's biggest telescopes all night long. Make sure you check out more of my video books, including The Grossest Picture Book Ever, Doggy Claus Perro Noel, Dinosaur Derby, and more. Learn about all my books at whimsicalworldbooks.com. Happy reading! <laughs>